Well, this seems like as good a time as any to get things going. So welcome everyone to this really exciting lecture, Hunting Kayaks of the North by Harvey Golden. My name is Genevieve Lemoyne. I'm the curator and the registrar of the Pierre Macmillan Arctic Museum. And we're very excited to be presenting this lecture and excited to finally, at least in a virtual way, be opening our newest exhibit, which is called Hayak, um, spelt with the Labrador Nunatsiava dialect spelling, in case anybody wonders. Um, and this is a new exhibit. The webpage just went live today. It's our first major online exhibit. Um, it's got all kinds of information about kayaks and traditional uh, use of, of these amazing boats. There's video, there's uh, a demonstration of building a replica uh, by Noah Nakasak and Fred Randall. There's all kinds of things on the webpage. So I encourage you after this webinar at your leisure to go and look at it. Uh, we're very proud of it and happy that it's finally available. And eventually you may even be able to come into the museum to see it. So that's, it does exist in, in real space as well as online, uh, but for now we're closed. Um, I, I will just give Harvey a very brief introduction. I suspect there are many people here who already know a great deal about Harvey, perhaps more than I do. Uh, but for those of you who don't, he's a remarkable man. He's done more work to understand traditional skin boats of the North than any other living person, I suspect. Um, he's visited museums all over the world to study historic skin boats. He's measured them, documented them, and built replicas of them, many of which you can see behind him. Um, he, he runs a museum out there in uh, Portland, Oregon, the Lincoln Street Kayak and Canoe Museum, which, like our museum, is closed to the public right now, but eventually you may be able to go and visit. Um, he's published numerous books, some of them now out of print and in great demand on the secondary used book market, I understand. Um, uh, and in addition, he doesn't just make these boats, of course, he also paddles them. Um, you could see on our poster a photograph of him in one of his kayaks. Uh, and he's going to tell us in a brief time, a very condensed version of some of his vast amount of knowledge about hunting kayaks of the north. And so, Harvey, at that point, I think I should turn it over to you because we're far more interested in hearing from you than from me. Oh. So thank you for being here. And do you want to share your screen now? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. The, the, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble here finding the, oh, there it is, okay. Sorry, my computer's a little slow tonight. Uh... Uh... It hasn't come up yet. Yeah, sorry. Yes, for those in the audience, this is the first virtual presentation that we at the museum have done. So we're, we're perhaps not as technologically smooth as we will eventually become, but. Okay, I think we're getting there. Sorry about the delay here. It's quite new to this too. <laughs> okay, now it says you're starting to share your screen. That's right, okay, yeah. yeah. There seems to be quite a delay between clicking and having the information come up, but I... Mm, yeah. 
slow internet speeds, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, now we can see your screen. And I think I can see your PowerPoint behind the Zoom screen. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to bring it to the front. It's uh, the little wheel is spinning, but uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> there we are. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry about the delay. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, th thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak. And uh, it's very exciting that you're having uh, an exhibit on the kayak uh, at, at your museum. Um, see. So I'll be talking about just the history and diversity of kayaks. Um, which is kind of a, um, it's going to cover a lot of ground. I introduce a lot of different concepts about what goes into um, kayaks as, as, a, as a concept and as the, uh, the final object. Um, uh, waiting for the next slide. It seems to be going quite slow. Hmm. The uh, next slide isn't coming up. Um, Just sometimes if it's a large image, it takes a little while to show up. Well, we're uh, waiting. Okay. Yeah, and all the, all the dry runs, it comes out quite fast, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's never been so cool. <laughs> well, we're waiting. I'll just, I forgot to mention to the audience that if you have questions as the talk is going on, you will all be muted throughout this but you can use the Q&A, which you can find down at the bottom of your screen to post questions. Um, and we will do what we can to ask to answer them afterwards. Um, and if you see a question that you would really like to hear an answer to, if you click the little thumbs up button, that will tell us that many people are interested in that question. Hmm. Not even seeing my cursor anymore. Um, I can see your cursor moving around. Uh, I'm, I'm not seeing it at all on my, my end of it. Uh, hmm. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I thought we'd start with the definition of what is a kayak. Um, the 1913 Webster's Dictionary, not, not my go-to dictionary, but um, describes it as a light canoe made of skins stretched over a frame and usually capable of carrying but one person who sits amidships and uses a double-bladed paddle. Is oops, sorry, it's jumping ahead now. Um, it is peculiar to the Eskimos and other Arctic tribes. Um, the definition is uh, very outdated. Um, it's kayaks are capable of carrying two or three people, of course, as the person here is demonstrating. And also um, single blade paddles are actually quite common for, for kayaks. Uh, population wise, um, before European contact, probably most kayaks or uh, would, ha would have had single blade paddles due to the population um, around the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. There's uh, huge populations and they typically use single blade paddles. So there's exceptions to the, uh, the definition. Um, this, this gentleman certainly illustrates uh, several of them. Um, the next concept to cover is um, well, actually a current definition of kayak. It's come to mean in our culture, um, everything from um, fiberglass or plastic and whitewater kayak. So it's not necessarily skin on frame anymore, but the, the original definitions definitely um, are. And kayak itself is a uh, Inuktitut word. So it comes from the, the Northern cultures. Um, with it defined, uh, one might ask why is a kayak? What was their context? Um, there's many different factors that um, have led to uh, the existence of kayaks, some of them environmental, others uh, cultural. Um, just a quick rundown of those climate, uh, latitude and altitude, material resources. Those two are very connected. Um, one reason uh, kayaks exist is because there's not resources to build other types of boats up in the Arctic or even, uh, even in the subarctic. 
food resources, uh, whether it's consistent or intermittent, water conditions, lay of the land, just the general geography of the region. Some cultural aspects are uh, tradition, adaptability, um, the manufacturing technology, uh, hunting and fishing technology, and that includes both uh, the capture of food and processing. There's also external influences, which, which are a tremendous factor. Um, the obvious one is uh, European contact has, has um, made uh, huge, huge influences on kayak culture. And of course, uh, social organization. Um, two illustrations show kayak building um, on two ends of the, the Arctic, uh, North Alaska and West Greenland. Um, going way back, uh, how, how far back does human navigation go? How long have people been using boats? Is, is always been an interesting question to me. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much how we got, you know, where humanity has gotten, you know, aviation is only just a recent, recent invention. Um, so um, there's two ways to look at that and that's direct and indirect evidence. Um, the direct evidence would be um, actual boats um, or their remains, uh, the oldest, intact boat uh, was found, I think, in a, in a bog in Holland, uh, and it's been carbon dated to about 9,500 years ago, the Pesh canoe. Um, it's uh, fairly small, I think, just under 10 feet long. Um, it was, some people had theorized that it might have been a cattle trough, because it would certainly function as one, but um, it actually uh, has dated about 1,000 years older than the domestication of cattle in that region, um, and actually, since it's been um, um, excavated, someone has built a replica of it and it seems to paddle fine judging by the photos of it I, I've seen online. The oldest ocean canoe um, is actually the, the actual part of the canoe is not, or vessel is not there anymore. It's a reed uh, imprinted on bitumen fragments with barnacles. So it's a, an asphalt sealant that was put on a reed boat that had barnacles on one side and the reeds imprinted on the other. And it's um, kind of suggested there was some form of navigation in the ocean at that point. And that's 7,000 years ago from Kuwait. Um, but we know that people ha had been using boats much, much longer than this. Uh, people didn't swim to Crete 130,000 years ago, um, but uh, they must have gotten there somehow on boats. Uh, what's interesting is that the first navigators um, were probably not even of our species. They're probably uh, Homo erectus. There's a, um, an area between, I think it's Bali and Flores Island. Um, maybe not Flores, I might have that wrong, but uh, in the Indonesian archipelago, it's 15 miles of open ocean, 4,600 feet deep. Oh, at Bali to Lombok, it says right there. Uh, 4,600 feet deep. So even with the, the various sea levels over the ice ages, it still would have been a considerable distance to navigate. Um, and they found Homo erectus fossils on the far side of it, uh, dated over 700,000 years. So that's um, that, that takes you way back, way, way back. Um, and even to have gotten this far from um, from the Rift Valley in Africa or Northwest Africa, as they theorized uh, humans evolved first, um, they would have needed boats to cross many of the rivers that come down, um, especially off the Himalayas. Uh, so the, the navigation definitely goes back well beyond that. A lot of people theorize what the earliest boats must have looked like and uh, typically um, dugout canoes uh, or rafts come up. Um, carved canoe is the, the preferred term nowadays for, for dugout canoes. Um, and that's a form of um, reduction to create a boat. That's where you remove materials from a log and reveal the boat inside of it. Um, a raft is a bit of the opposite. It's a, it's a construction where you get materials and bring them together to build a boat. Um, both of these require very sophisticated stone tools um, to build. And um, so stone tools probably came much later after boats were invented. Um, so my theory um, is that there's probably the first boats were uh, reed boats. Uh, they can be made out of um, reeds or ambatch, out of reeds like Thule reeds. Um, and uh, they can easily be made without tools at all. 
yeah, it's certainly helpful to have, um, you know, maybe a fit to, to thread um, the line to tie the bundles together. And the tying material would, you know, at least in the northern Paiute to build them around here, uh, use cattails, which grows right next to the tule reeds. Um, uh, a knife would be helpful. Uh, hip waders would be ideal, but those came much later. Uh, they also, um, reeds were quite common in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, where uh, humans were thought to have truly developed and you know first struck off for the for the for the great beyond, um, reed boats um, can be found pretty much uh, many many different continents all over: uh, Bolivia, Peru, Chad, Sardinia, Saudi Arabia, New Zealand, um, the northern Paiute uh, here in Oregon, uh, Iraq, California, Ireland, Portugal, Egypt, Sudan. Um, they uh, exist pretty much. You know, all all around the world, and uh, they're they're uh, quite interesting boats. The availability of materials and the properties of the materials guide and limit the form, size, and structure of a vessel. Uh, so you're not going to build container ships out of reed boats or reeds, and you're not going to build you know, surfboards out of aluminum, um, you know, or 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 canoes out of cast iron. Uh, but a boat builder must adjust their requirements for a vessel accordingly and or adjust their methods and purposes for its use. So the materials really determine, you know, the size and the shape and the function of the boat. Um, and because of this, um, it can lead to a lot of consistency of form and use over great distances. And um, that's um, pretty evident when you look at um, the form and shapes of these reed boats from around the world, you, you have essentially um, individual bundles of reeds that are made, long cigar-shaped reed, and then uh, they are uh, bundled together to make the raft form. Uh, these examples, you see uh, Pomo uh, Indians in California, uh, coastal Peru, um, Bolivia, uh, which is where some of the most famous ones come from, um, and then uh, Sudan. You'll see on the Sudanese one, the, the, the reeds are much thicker. It's an ambatch, uh, which is uh, uh, much more substantial than the Thule reeds. Yeah, because of the properties of these, they, they, they all resemble each other quite a bit, even though they're separated by you know, thousands of miles in, in many of these cases. Um, the requirements of the builder, um, let's see, um, the materials will lead to a large extent to, to convergence, which is people set, settling along the same solutions. Um, Deri uh, derived independently. Uh, here's uh, three examples of uh, what's commonly termed sturgeon nose canoes. Um, and they're from very, very di different regions. Uh, the first one uh, is from the Arafura swamps of Northern Australia. Um, the image is actually from a movie, 10 Canoes, um, about a, a family uh, living there, an Aboriginal family. And so it's, it's an incredible movie, great footage of building these canoes and using them. The black and white image is uh, from the Nanai River in the Russian Far East. Um, and the lower one is a Kootenai canoe, which is a type used on the upper Columbia River. That's a replica um, that I made. And these, the form of these is um, based on uh, folding the bark uh, into a shape without cutting gores into it. And it's usually barks that are less pliable than birch bark. So they're, 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 they're stiffer and harder to work with. So you don't see the fine forms of uh, most birch bark canoes in North America. And uh, when you fold them into a bark, uh, you know, a boat shape and fold the ends up, they kind of meet at a long sloping um, end. So you whip stitch the ends together and you get this long sturgeon nose and it prevents there from being any seams underwater also. So, so it's kind of uh, useful in that sense, but uh, this is, just one of the defining forms caused by uh, limited resources or, or not less than ideal materials. Um, this convergence, you also see it in everyday items. Uh, spoons, of course, are going to look more or less the same all around the world. Um, there might be some uh, terminological differences. You, one person's spoon, you, another person might consider to be a ladle, but you know the function is the same and the form is pretty much the same as well. Um, these earlier stone tools, I mean, to drill a hole in a piece of wood is to essentially twist a harder, sharper metal into it or, or material into it. 
uh, so it's it's pretty it's going to be the same uh, all around, especially in, in Stone Age societies. Um, as you see later, there's more mechanical means of getting it to twist. Um, some of them use straps um, to to turn the turn the drill to drill holes in there. But the the point of the drill and the the function is is pretty much um, all the same all the way across. And that that's the convergence. Uh, it's interesting to note that the earliest stone tools. Um, stone drills on this page um, show that uh, cordless drills were the first ones to be invented. You know, it's been a fairly one-dimensional look at materials uh, so far for boat building, um, but by combining materials or developing new technologies, you can change the properties of materials. Uh, modern boat builders will know this about applying heat to uh, oak. You can bend it real tight and, and get uh, different forms. Um, these Iraqi kafas, um, uh, they're a thin wall of uh, coiled grass rope um, bound uh, to withier palm stem frames, and they're sealed uh, to be waterproof with hot bitumen, which, which is a local, locally found petroleum product. Um, so this is a, um, a good example of integrating technologies and also um, um, changing the technologies or, or the materials by like heating up the bitumen to get it to seal easier. So there's other ways to process materials. Um, this essentially um, is a fiber coated with a petroleum resin. So it's it's essentially, this is carbon fiber technology right here. It's a, a fiberglass boat, I guess one could say. Now there's two main forms of uh, skin boats. Um, there's the type that we're mostly talking about, which is skin on frame, which is where you put a skin over a wooden structure, uh, which these uh, two gentlemen here with the coracles uh, from Wales are showing us. But uh, there's another type that's the uh, inflatable skins. And those those types of skin boats are known um, not as extensively around the world as, um, as reed boats, but uh, you see them in um, Tierra del Fuego, Northern India, many places in between, and certainly uh, bags, skin bags were used for carrying liquids and of course inflated, they would know that there would be a, a flotation method. Um, skin is also um, a material that requires a lot of processing. So it's not just the skin off an animal to a boat, but you have to um, uh, scrape the hides, ensure that the, all the fat and the grease and the meat is off the hides. You have to dehair the hides ideally for less weight and resistance. Um, there's many different technologies uh, to, to do that, uh, whether it's, um, uh, well, in the Arctic, the examples are to um, soak them in urine and, and so kind of an acid bath to dehair them and to get rid of the grease and fats from them. Also to bury them in the ground and let them kind of rot off a bit there's, or just scrape them with very sharp objects. So there's a lot of processing that goes into that. And once they're on boats, they need a lot of oiling and waterproofing. Um, what's interesting and will be shown later is that uh, both inflatables and uh, rigid frame skin boats uh, were very critical technologies uh, in the Arctic uh, kayak tradition. So this brings us to uh, kayaks, uh, which are skin on frame is the common expression of their, of their construction. Um, there's other examples around the world of um, skin boats with, with a wooden, wooden frame. So essentially it's you build the wooden skeleton and then uh, sew or lash or strap skins around them and that keeps the water out and keeps, keeps one float. This contrasts um, with how bark canoes uh, are, are built. Uh, bark canoes are also construction, but they're done in a reverse order with the, the skin or the bark uh, being laid out. Uh, some, some nautical historians haven't distinguished between um, uh, skin and bark. They, they, they consider them both to be skin boats of, of a form. Nishimura uh, in the 1930s described skin boats or bark canoes in his, his volume on skin boats. And as Noah um, uh, uh, mentioned in, the, um, in, in one of the videos, your museum has published on the terminology of kayaks, the, the inuktitut word uh, amik for the skin um, also uh, can mean bark, but getting back to the canoe, um, canoes are built with the skin laid out first and propped up into a bowl shape, and then the frame is inserted loosely, uh, but in, in compression. So it's a skin and then the frame, as opposed to kayaks are built uh, frame 
and then the skin. Um, in the Arctic, um, there's another type of skin boat, and that is the Umiak. It's a large open boat. Um, I think the longest um, recorded Umiaks uh, were about um, 60 feet long, I think, in some places. Um, and they're, they're uh, quite large, quite heavy, and they have an incredible payload compared to a, uh, to a kayak. This, uh, this image here is from East Greenland, um, and you can see the volume difference between the three kayaks there and the Umiak. It's, it's uh, quite a remarkable size difference. And uh, Umiak light kayaks um, have a solid, rigid frame. And uh, you'll often see pictures of frames of kayaks or umiaks out. And, and it should be mentioned that the skins covering these boats were replaced uh, almost every year. So uh, the skins are very ephemeral. Um, the skins don't last so long and you need to maintain really good skins. And so um, you taking them off every year gives you a chance to uh, make repairs and modifications to the kayak frames. So they, they could always be adjusting or repairing or fixing their kayaks because every year the skins would be off. Um, umiaks were used for um, um, hunting um, and gathering, uh, also trading in commerce, uh, migration. There was a trade between um, North America and uh, Eurasia across the Bering Sea with uh, umiaks for centuries, I think, even through the uh, Cold War, which is, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, earlier, I talked about uh, direct and indirect evidence of um, earliest navigation. But uh, let's, let's apply that to um, skin boats. Uh, the oldest direct evidence of Arctic skin boats um, comes from um, a number of models found at um, Ekven Cemetery in Chukotka. Um, and these fossil ivory models have been dated to about, uh, I think the older one's about 2000 BCE. Um, and they are, um, uh, pretty consistently formed uh, and unusually formed, as you can see. This looks unlike any any uh, boat we see nowadays. One might ask if it's um, if a model is direct evidence. Um, there's good arguments for saying that yes, it is or or it isn't. Um, you know, is if I had a toy uh, flying saucer that I lost out in the woods one day, if archaeologists are going to find that in a hundred years and infer that. Um, Forest people in Oregon used to have flying saucers. You know, that's that's a little tenuous. Um, another question is: is that model even a boat? Um, to me, certain elements suggest that it is, and it generally is accepted that that is a model of a boat. That um, has an oval cockpit shape, um, has what appears to be deck lines. Um, there's a marked a raised center line deck seam. It could be a, to indicate a deck stringer or just where the, the skins are lapped over, uh, sewn in place. The hull shape is, uh, is, is a reasonable looking hull shape. It, it, it seems perfectly viable for a boat. What's really unusual, and I, I think probably jumped out at most of you, is the very unusual gunnel ends. Uh, they, um, they splay out um, and without converging. Um, and that's a very unusual feature, but um, what fascinates me is, is that that is a feature that um, exists in uh, recent Umiaks and Umiaks today, in fact. Uh, the engraving here shows an Umiak model uh, collected at uh, Utkiavik, which is uh, Point Barrow, Alaska in 1880s. And as you can see, the gunnels, they go to the ends and they join a crossboard, but uh, they, they carry out a bit more. Um, as you can see on one end of the gunnel, they, they keep going and then they, they, then they join. At the other end, they, they're cut off a bit and they stick out a bit. Uh, they don't stick out quite as bit as on the old model, but um, it's uh, these non-conjoined gunnels, um, they may serve two practical purposes. Uh, well, actually two purposes, one practical, one functional. Uh, one is that they distribute the joinery over a broader area where you have pieces of wood coming together. You have to tie them together or drill holes or have mortises and so that that interacts with the, the solidity of the pieces. Um, having them joined to a broad headboard, like on the Umiak, they're more distributed, but that's probably not as important as, um, as the shape, the, the, the sh desired shape that's um, caused by this, this type of construction. The photograph here um, is of a Umiak replica I built years ago, and um, it allows for um, a sharp, narrow cutwater down low, you know, where you need it. 
But if it's pitching in bigger waves, the water comes higher up, but it reaches the part where the boat gets a lot broader. So there's a lot of buoyancy mass very high up above the sharp cut water. And so if you can envision this boat covered with skins, uh, you will uh, see essentially uh, what's shown in this next photo, which, which is a little unexpected, I know. Uh, it's very much the same shape as uh, you see on the hurricane bow of an aircraft carrier. Now this is convergence in a sense. Um, they obviously were not made this way for the same reason. They, the Navy needed a broad runway on top of a boat. So, uh, so you have this, this wide uh, platform up there. But as you can see, it's got a narrow cut water down low. If this boat were to pitch into a huge wave, um, it would immerse enough that a lot more buoyancy was preventing it from going underwater. And so you wouldn't have your flight deck ripped off like uh, earlier aircraft carriers had to deal with. And of course, um, seeing a model like this, I had to um, I had to try it out. I had to build one. <laughs> so I built a, a full size uh, conjectural interpretation of this this kayak. And uh, um, it really doesn't say anything about whether they did exist or anything or whether it even was a boat or anything. But it uh, it turned out to be a nice boat. It turned out to be a, actually kind of a, a lovely design. Uh, nice broad ends, very easy to carry. It has two, you know, it's like carrying a wheelbarrow almost because <laughs> with the with the handles like that. The only downside to this um, this kayak is it ended up looking like a banana slug. Um, so it's a little embarrassing to take it out anymore. But, uh, um, what's interesting is uh, there are some kayaks of the, the recent period that uh, inside their structure, it's not so evident outside the structure, but inside the structure, you see um, remnants of these um, these gunnels that don't converge. Uh, Unangan kayaks, uh, Aleutian kayaks, um, have um, have gunnels that do not come together at their ends, both the bow and the stern. At the stern, they're generally quite wide, um, and they have this board that crosses. And it's, it's much like umiaks. Uh, the gunnels don't extend out into into the handholds, um, and as you can see. Um, on this example, the, uh, the, the Unangan extended the boat with uh, a fin in the back to kind of draw the water line out to be a bit more sleek and hydrodynamic. Um, and the bow, they have this um, a broad plank on the top that kind of fares it out into a more hydrodynamic um, uh, wave piercing uh, type shape. So it's, it's lost a bit of the umiak form, but inside it's uh, structured very much like an umiak. So there, there's a bit of a remnant and pre precedent, um, uh, or a descendant rather, from the, the old um, Akvik models. Um, and you see this to a lesser extent in, um, in Yupiak and um, Yupik kayaks, with the gunnels ex being broadened a little bit towards the ends. It doesn't change the volume tremendously in this form, but um, this, this may actually function more as uh, having more mass in the in the timber to uh, distribute the joinery a bit better um, with uh, more drilled holes. Uh, you can the drawing on the left, the top one shows the bow end of a Unangan uh, kayak, half half of it with half of the um, cross piece, and the bottom drawing shows the the joined ends. So you see this in in some Alaskan kayaks as well. Um, and we'll go to uh, indirect evidence of skin boats. Um, Skin boats, um, they don't last long. They, they rot and fall apart pretty fast, even in an Arctic climate. So there's not very many actual uh, pieces of kayaks, uh, probably beyond um, uh, spitballing here, maybe 800 years. There's, there's very, very the, the wood and the, the skins rot and fall apart pretty fast. It just doesn't preserve in the, in the archaeology. Um, but there's um, tools and equipment used by um, um, the Inuit and other uh, Arctic peoples that uh, would suggest that. And a primary one would be the, the valves and uh, plugs used in inflated floats that were used for um, harpoon hunting. Uh, these, these are good, uh, good evidence of skin boats, um, especially when you find them in an area where there's no other viable boats like birch bark canoes or carved canoes, where there has to be skin boats, just ecologically. Um, so the float attachments um, would serve as um, evidence of these. Now these 
these floats would be used uh, maritime hunting, either for attaching harpoon lines to seals or whales. Uh, they'd mark and slow down the position of the whales. Uh, they would be used uh, with umiaks. Uh, the photo of the um, man butchering the, the bowhead whale is from North Alaska. And you can see at the stern of, of his umiak, there's um, two inflated seal skins uh, bobbing in the background. Now, the lower image um, shows uh, two hunters in Greenland um, probably tying um, a towing gear into a beluga that they've hunted. And you can see an inflated sealskin float in the back of one kayak and the other one attached to the, uh, to the beluga. Uh, these two images uh, really highlight the harsh, harsh and dangerous conditions that uh, skin boats were used in. Um, if such nozzles um, from inflated boats were found elsewhere, uh, one might ask, well, is that an indicator of skin boats at one time? And the answer is not necessarily because um, other hunters um, around the world using very different types of boats also use inflated uh, seal skins for whaling, uh, most notably on the northwest coast, uh, my neighborhood. Um, they had uh, harpoon hunting uh, from uh, carved canoes, cedar canoes, and they use very much the same technology in terms of uh, toggling harpoon heads uh, long lines and um, uh, attached to inflated seal skin floats. So, um, you know, this is a thousand miles away from the nearest skin boat culture. So, you know, the, the context of where one finds these is an important um, aspect also. Uh, these, these whaling technologies are so, so um, perfected that there's a lot of conversions with them. There's uh, a whaling culture in Indonesia um, and their harpoon heads are nearly identical to the forms used by Northwest Coast and also the uh, Inupiat at Point Barrow for whale hunting. So there's a lot of um, similarities between these technologies. Now, if one were to find these types of little valves um, and sockets in like the Bering Coast of uh, Northern United Kingdom, you know, they, they, that could indicate maybe a one-time skin boat culture or it could, could be parts of an old bagpipe. Now, one question that's, that's interesting to me is, um, is there such thing as an indirect evidence of kayaks specifically? Is there, is there something that would specify kayaks as opposed to kayaks and umiaks? Because um, hunting floats, as I've shown, have been used with kayaks and umiaks. Um, one aspect of approaching this is to consider the, uh, how umiaks were used and how kayaks were used. Umiaks are uh, a communal a communal boat. Uh, kayaks are extremely independent. They're as about as in independent as a boat gets. Um, they barely hold one person, whereas it takes uh, a coordinated crew uh, who all know what they're doing and a lot of communication between them uh, in order to operate a, uh, an umiak. Uh, so that's one aspect that uh, one would consider in uh, seeing if there's any uh, indirect evidence of kayaks. Um, there are some objects that turn up in uh, archaeological sites that would suggest to me uh, a reliance on kayaks. And that's, that's um, the darts, parts of um, darts and parts of throwing boards uh, would suggest to me that um, kayaks were involved. These darts are much lighter tools than the heavier harpoons used for whaling and, and walrus hunting. They could be thrown a lot farther. Um, the example on the on the left is a uh, bird dart, um, and then there's a throwing board shown that one would throw these with, and you can throw them quite far with uh, with the extra leverage of a of a throwing board. The other darts um, on the right side um, um, are very various, various types from the Arctic. There's uh, bladder darts. The ones with the bags on them have um, it's smaller than a s inflated seal skin. It's just a small bladder, um, just to give it a little bit of flotation. So the, these were um, able to be thrown much further and the little bent valves that hold them and the, the, the plugs that uh, you inflate them with and the smaller points and tips of these uh, would, would uh, you know, if they found the um, ivory remnants of these in an archeological site would, would suggest the presence of darts, you know, when even the shafts are uh, long gone. Uh, the advantage of darts is that, um, and for kayaks for using darts is that, uh, the darts require a lot more agility and strength uh, and, and stealth, sorry, than an umiak can offer. So uh, they're better used from kayaks. They'd be launched more effectively, further and accurately 
uh, with the throwing boards. Um, heavy harpoons in Greenland could be thrown 60 feet accurately. These, these could easily be thrown uh, probably twice that with, with a skilled um, hunter. But once you throw the dart, you have to uh, immediately follow up um, uh, with some quick paddling to follow the prey because uh, these darts are much lighter. They're not going to stop an animal in its track and you have to chase the, chase the animal uh, in order to secure the darted prey. So the agility um, and sole control of a kayak is, is helpful with darts. Um, another interesting question is, is how long have people been in the Arctic? Um, um, the human presence in the Arctic keeps getting kicked back. I, I think when I was in high school, it was, uh, they thought 16,000 years um, that uh, the, there was a site, uh, the Yana site in uh, Northern Russia, they dated it to 25,000 years ago. And I think that was uh, just a fairly recent recent find, but uh, just recently they pushed it back um, to 45,000 years ago. They found butcher marks on uh, mammoth bones uh, in I think uh, Northern Russia as well. Um, so for people to be up that far North living, um, can, you know, is, 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 quite a, is quite a technological feat. Um, how do they do that? Uh, certainly, um, you know, in winters, the rivers are frozen. You can cross rivers uh, by foot, but uh, the rest of the year they run very cold. You'll, you'll need some types of boats. Um, so there's a one, one technology, um, I think above all stands out the most to me that, that was the most critical thing in letting humans uh, live uh, comfortably in the Arctic. Uh, and that was, uh, interestingly, the, the very smallest tool, needles. Um, fine needles uh, in the technology of processing skins and, and working them um, to make uh, durable, heavy clothing enabled people to live up there. Um, for boats, uh, you needed very good needles in order to do uh, waterproof seams on the skins. Um, not just any seam would do on a boat. And you had to um, uh, render the skin um, so it wouldn't soak up water or fall apart. Uh, there's, there's many, many, uh, many requirements to have, you know, to get a boat covered with skin to be viable. Uh, there's uh, the typical method of sewing skins around a boat involve a double, a double seam. So they do one join, one, uh, one stitch where they join the skin together and then another where they fold it over. Um, so it's kind of double stitched, keeps the water out better. But another interesting thing about working with skin um, that people with a work with fabric might not think about is that when you sew with skin with a needle, you're not, you don't need to go all the way through the skin. You can go partway into it and then back out. The drawing in the, the, the top left shows that the lower needle is going into the skin and then coming back out without going all the way through it like the upper needle. So with that type of um, quality needles and quality stitching, um, you can do a, a skin boat that's uh, much more inherently waterproof um, than uh, just blowing all the way through the skin with a needle, with a crude needle with a heavier, heavier gauge thread. Um, we certainly don't know what boats in the Arctic looked like 45,000 years ago. And, and I showed you the example, the oldest example of um, ivory models, which is 2,000 years ago. But we, we do know that um, uh, way before uh, European contact with Arctic peoples, there was a, a very rich and diverse um, forms of, of kayaks up in, up in the Arctic. Uh, this is just a variety of um, uh, archaeological models, most of them um, over uh, 1,500 years old or 1,200 years old. It just shows the variety. Of, of Arctic types. Um, some of them are very unusual, very unexpected. Um, there's a sturgeon nose canoe from Deering, Alaska that um, is very is very intriguing. Um, it's from an area where skin boats would have been used. It's very unlikely they had dugout canoes or, or bark canoes, but that form in the model is, um, is there. And, and that must have been a representation of, of some boat someone was familiar with over there. Uh, many of these are long extinct forms. Some of them uh, do resemble boats that uh, exist today. This, um, this map shows the extent of uh, the Arctic kayak tradition, the hunting, hunting kayak tradition. Uh, it's kind of, I've just 
allocated an uh, arbitrary date of 1700, which was uh, pre-contact for most of these people, but post-contact for others. The, the, the Inuit, uh, interestingly, were some of the earliest um, North Americans that um, the Europeans came in contact with, I think in the uh, late 1500s uh, or, or early, maybe the early 1500s, uh, some connection up in up where the uh, uh, Norse ran into uh, Greenlanders, actually it'd be a little earlier than that, uh, probably probably 1300s. And then some, some groups of Inuit in um, central Canada were only uh, contacted as recently as the 1950s. So they are some of the oldest and some of the newest uh, North Americans, Europeans have had had contact with. Now, um, I, I call it an Arctic kayak tradition, but a lot of this, uh, a lot of this land is 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 technically subarctic. In fact, the Aleutian Islands dip down to the same latitude as London, England. It's it's just a very different climate, and it's a very uh, barren islands. Their their tundra and the the culture and the approach to the technology is definitely derived from from an Arctic uh, Arctic peoples. Um, so that map covers about 4,000 miles. Um, and the cultures there, they speak at least three mutually unintelligible languages. Um, and there's very many dialects uh, uh, within those. Uh, the cultures um, are reading from um, the Russian Far East to Greenland, the Koryak, the, the Chukchi, the Uit, um, and uh, North America, the Yupik, uh, Unangax, Sukpiak, and Yupiak. Inuit and Kalathlet. Uh, the Kalathlet are uh, the Greenlanders. Um, so they um, descend essentially from the Russian Far East all the way across North Arctic North America to the eastern side of side of Greenland. Now, during the um, these many thousands of years of development, um, they've resulted in a rich, uh, variegated forms of kayaks. Um, this illustration here from 1899 uh, shows this is um, quite a quite a number of different types of shapes. The top two are obviously uh, both both related. They're both from Nunavak Island in Alaska. But uh, this variation we see here uh, covers two different dialects or main languages, Yupik and Inupiat, and uh, covers about just just 500 miles of uh, of a stretch of Alaska coastline, Nunavak Island to Kotzebue Sound. Uh, in Greenland alone, there's at least 13 different types of kayaks, distinct forms um, from the last 400 years. And that's, that's based on uh, collected examples. This, uh, this page shows, uh, uh, these are all replicas I built, but these are all replicas of full-size kayaks and museums uh, showing just the, um, the entire breadth of, of forms from um, uh, the Russian Far East to East Greenland, all different shapes and sizes and and elaborate ends or simpler ends and uh, even different types of paddles. Paddles paddles from uh, 14 inches long to 11 foot 6 inches long and paddles from 2 inches wide to 6 inches wide. Um, just a tremendous uh, variation of form. Um, and when one starts to approach process, how, how do you how do you how do you start grouping them? And that, that's an interesting issue, you're looking for commonality. We certainly see all the differences here, but um, we started to look for commonality. Um, there's kind of two main types of kayaks uh, from the Arctic tradition. And it uh, could be called an east-west distinction. Um, and uh, there's, of course, many exceptions uh, to this, uh, but uh, these, these two main forms are, they, they serve pretty well and are pretty consistent. Um, the divide between these, uh, one might think, would be at the Yupik uh, and Yupiat language um, uh, border on the Seward Peninsula of Alaska. But um, interestingly, it's actually just north of that. So it's a bit into the uh, Inupiat area. Um, this is the major language um, border uh, in Arctic North America. Uh, the Unangan, of course, speak a very different language uh, as well, but the, the Yupik and Inupiat, uh, mutually unintelligible language. Inupiat is this pretty much with dialectical differences, the same language is spoken all the way across uh, Arctic North America to Greenland. So a Greenlander um, dropped off at, um, at uh, Point Hope would be able to have a conversation with, uh, with locals there. Um, but this uh, divide between 
kayak types is a little inward um, on the Inupiat line. Uh, it's between two di dialects, the Kawiariak and the uh, Malamute uh, line. And there's some, um, there's some overflow of kayak traits from the south up into the uh, Malamute um, region, which is interesting too. Um, let's see. Going into the kayak, um, you see a lot of framing differences. The Western type could be called a timber and rod. Um, the gunnels are kind of squarish in cross section. They're, they're thick, but shallow. Um, and the, the chines and keelsons are kind of, kind of roundish or thinnish battens um, or rods generally. The Eastern type generally has deep gunnels that are thinner um, and often kind of thin batten chines or keelsons. Uh, there's, um, as I said, exceptions galore on this, but um, what's interesting is you look at the cross sections in these pictures and you see that the shallower gunnels of the, of the, uh, the Western type, uh, you can bend them up and down quite easily. Um, and, but the, um, the raised deck stringer with the raised deck um, gives it kind of a triangular cross section with a tripod cross section. So a lot more stiffness. And you can also bend the boat into a reverse shear. As you see the kayak at the top curves, you know, the shear line curves down at the ends instead of up. And so you can do that with these, these bendable gunnels. The lower one has these, these tall, thin ones. So there, it would be very stiff longitudinally. Um, so you have to cut, cut the, the gunnels to shape. And that one has just a, a, a light gradual shear line to it. Um, but again, there's always exceptions. It's like um, in Unangan kayaks, they have this this uh, timber and rod form, but their keelson is a plank on edge that's very deep instead of just a, just a shallow little keelson. And Greenland kayaks have plank on edge chines and keelsons uh, generally. Um, this is a view into uh, both of the types where you can, you can see the differences again. Uh, raised uh, curved deck beams in the Western type um, and straight deck beams with a flat deck on the, on the Eastern type. Um, the top one's a Bristol Bay type. Um, and the other one is a uh, copper Inuit replica. Uh, with, you can see the depth of the gunnels are uh, quite different on each. Um, another interesting thing shown here is uh, there's a, the lashings go different directions at the, at the same, the same line between East and West. On the upper one of the Western types, they're always lashed uh, from gunnel to gunnel across the ribs. So you see the lashings go, um, you know, down one side and up the other. And the lashings on the eastern types go fore and aft, so they start at one end and run to the other. So you can see the continuous lashings um, um, on this lower one, the eastern type. Um, another interesting approach is how they put the skins on the kayaks. The western method uh, uses a very, a very complicated uh, method where they, they sew a sock um, with the skins to put over the front of the kayak, and they, they pull it on. Um, and stretch it on, and then uh, they attach um, joined skins to the back to cover it. Um, it's called the sock method. The eastern eastern method is a whole piece. So they join five, six, or seven seal skins together into one long uh, skin, and then they um, attach it to the kayak frame. Uh, the photos on the left show the uh, manufacture of the sock, and then the middle photo is uh, stretching it onto a King Island kayak uh, with, uh, with ropes to pull it up in place. Um, and then the bottom photo shows men uh, pulling the, the skin onto the, to the kayak frame. Uh, this, this goes into the uh, a social aspect of kayak building in that uh, women um, were the ones that did the skin work. Uh, it's a very, very uh, strict gender role across the Arctic. Um, in Greenland, you see the, the women sewing the, the, the skin onto the kayak. Uh, men helped with stretching, but never sewing. It was a very, very strict gender role. Um, another aspect uh, distinguishing the two types is how they finish the cockpit combings, the, the, the hoop that you sit in. Um, on the Western form, um, the, kayak, the combing was part of the kayak frame. It was, uh, it was lashed to the frame. A kayak without a, a skin would have its frame as, you know, it would have its combing in place. So when they cover the kayak frame in the Western uh, type the skin goes over the combing then is drawn inside the kayak and where it's finished and sewn uh, so you get the combing covered with skin uh, when viewed from the outside the eastern types um, the combings are not part of the kayak frame they are added after the skin is on so they're sewn 
the skin is brought up into the combing and then lashed to it, as you can see on the two photos or the two drawings on the, on the right. So that's another distinguishing feature. Um, now there's similarities between the two and this, this um, um, one could call it convergence, but really, really it's, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of cultural continuity across. So it's, it's really just the same technology having migrated and adapted to different boat forms. Um, you see a lot of the same hunting equipment on very different kayaks. Uh, this uh, upper kayak is a, a kayak from Nunavak Island uh, from Alaska. You see that tray on the, on the, um, on the left in front of the cockpit. Um, it has a coiled line in it um, that holds the coiled harpoon line. So when you throw the harpoon, um, the line feeds out of there and the line trails back to the hunting float, which is on the back of the kayak. You see the exact same equipment on the East Greenland kayak below it. Uh, you see a raised hunting or, or harpoon line stand. Um, but there's a, the owner's left his hat on top of it, so you can't see the line. And, but the line goes from there back to an inflated seal skin float, just like the above. So it's very much the same, same technologies used for hunting sea mammals. Um, some interesting local differences are uh, the sled on the back of the Nunavak Island kayak um, and the uh, camouflage uh, hunting screen on the front of the East Greenland kayak that made the kayak look like a piece of ice um, floating. So seals would think it was a, just a piece of ice instead of a hunter right behind it. Um, these large um, Western kayaks, the type such as that had the sled on the back, um, they're built to have a, a large capacity of uh, material stored inside and that's, that's material being meat, seals. Um, so when they hunted, they would put the seals inside the boats. Um, so, and they would also have room for um, a deck on top. So they're very high volume boats with lots of cargo space. Um, and the reason for that is uh, their main, their primary method of hunting was to go out in the spring um, and there'd be a lot of sea ice in the spring. And they'd often uh, pull the boats up onto the sea ice and hunt from the sea ice. And uh, sometimes the sea ice would, um, would blow in and, um, or out, it could leave or come at any time, huge amounts of it. And sometimes you might be stranded on a huge raft of sea ice. And that's why you had a sled with you because if you have 600 pounds of seals inside your kayak and you need to tow it across um, you know, a huge field of sea ice, you, you need a sled to move it. So they would often go out with sleds on top of their, their kayaks. Um, let's see, these kayaks, as you can see, they often have stylized ends, these, these bearing seat types. Uh, either a handhold built into the back frame or, or a hole in the front. And these, these would help them lift it up onto the sea ice as well. So, so these, these stylistic um, forms also served as a, as, as a function. Uh, these same forms were used further down the Alaskan coast. Uh, and what's interesting is uh, they were used in regions where there, weren't, there wasn't uh, chances of hunting on sea ice. Uh, because the, the climate was more temperate. And so um, what's interesting is you, you see what may be an evolution away from the, the Bering Sea proportions of the, the large meat haulers that would carry sleds on the back. And that's um, the, like the, uh, the Sukpiak kayaks. This, this is an example of a, a replica of a Chugach kayak um, that's at the Canadian Canoe Museum. Um, they became a little shallower, not as much room inside and, and um, perhaps to counteract the lack of uh, a heavy sled on the back deck, um, the cockpits generally are moved a bit further back. You also see this on um, Unangan uh, or Aleutian kayaks. They're smaller and the cockpits are moved further back. So they, they've adapted a, um, a Bering Sea cargo boat essentially to more open water uh, year round use. Now um, on the Eastern side, um, in Greenland, for example, where these images are from, um, the kayaks have very little internal capacity. Um, East Greenland kayaks are some of the shallowest kayaks from the Arctic tradition. They're usually six inches deep um, at the cockpit, and that's depth to shear. And that doesn't give you much room for your feet, much less seals or really anything else. Um, these kayaks are hard to get into. Um, and you know, there's six inches of space in there, but a lot of that space is taken up by the framework. So um, it's a very it's a very tight fit. Um, depending on the length and width of these eastern form kayaks, um, they they have um, uh, much much less volume, uh, and also they have flat decks also. So so that also decreases a lot of the internal space. 
Uh, the advantages of this is that they have very little wind resistance. Uh, you can take them out in horrendous conditions and they do not get blown around as much. Uh, so you have a lot better control. Um, one, now with knowing that the, the Western people would bring seals back inside their boats, you wonder how do the Greenlanders get meat home? Cause that's, that's the whole idea behind kayaks. Um, and how they would do it by uh, towing seals back. So when a Greenlander was successful, successful in hunting, they would uh, attach the seal to the kayak with straps and toggles. They'd hook them into the sides of their kayaks with underneath the deck lines and tow seals. And you could tow uh, quite a few seals together. You could hook them together and have a whole string of them um, if you were a successful hunter. Um, the decks on Greenland kayaks are so small, there's not room for, for seals generally, especially with the hunting equipment. Um, Kayaks uh, from Labrador, or East Canada, they would have more room on the decks for them. Um, yeah, the towing gear the Greenlanders developed for this is pretty sophisticated, and you know, finding that in an archaeological site could suggest um, you know kayak use in in particular. So, while there's two main types, um, one could uh, delineate their four uh, families of kayaks in, in the recent period, the recent period being you know, the period where we have extensive collected examples and you know, preserved uh, over time. It goes back about 400 years. Um, the, the three, uh, there's three types that could be considered maritime types. And the top one here is um, of the Western form that we, we talked about earlier. Um, the middle type is, um, is an Eastern, uh, Canadian Inuit uh, form, and it's the type uh, that, that your kayak is from, the, the Labrador kayak um, that's in your, your museum. Um, and the bottom one is the, the smaller um, Greenland kayak. Um, the East Canadian one is kind of defined by a, a very deep, um, long, long bow, uh, kind of a knife-like knife bow with a very low, flat aft deck, and it has a lot of, a lot of volume aft. Um, it's what uh, naval architects would call a Swede form kayak, where it's, it's very narrow up front and carries most of its beam uh, further back. The Greenland kayak is, uh, is a much smaller vessel and usually a little more symmetrical when viewed um, both in plan and elevation. Uh, the fourth type could be called a maritime kayak. They're used for uh, hunting uh, caribou on lakes and rivers uh, all the way from North Alaska, all the way to uh, West Hudson Bay. Um, and up to the magnetic North Pole area. Um, there are larger uh, uh, examples of these types that were used for maritime hunting. And even these three main maritime ones would be used for caribou hunting as well. So again, there's, there's exceptions um, all, all around. Um, let's see. This, is, uh, this shows the general distribution of the four types. They're, they're color coded to their respective regions. Um, and again, the, the breakdown between the Western and Eastern types, you can see that between the light blue and the red right at uh, Kotzebue sound. Um, there's a bit of overlap between um, the inland types and the, the East Canadian types between Wager Bay and the Glulik uh, with groups there used uh, both types. And you can see in Greenland, uh, the area where they, the Greenlanders use them. Now of these four types, there's one very notable exception to these, these four families in, in North America, and that's uh, the kayaks of the Siglet uh, or Inuvialuit uh, who live um, at where the uh, Mackenzie River meets the Beaufort Sea. Um, their kayaks are very unusual. They, um, they have some aspects that um, are similar to um, Kayaks of the Western form, uh, they have deck lines very similar to um, some from King Island, uh, Inubia types. Um, but their chines are very interesting. They're very broad and very thin. Uh, they almost look like the sheathing and bark canoes. Uh, they do have curved deck beams, but they're not very deep um, on the decks. And they have uh, very unusual ends, very symmetrical ends that come up into a vertical spike, as you can see in the image. So they're, they're quite an unusual type and they may um, exhibit um, some influence from um, upriver uh, birch bark canoe technology. Uh, what's interesting is, is in the photo, you see a, uh, one of the gentlemen is using a double bladed paddle and the other is single. This is actually the furthest east um, in the uh, North American Arctic that um, 
the kayak users uh, used single blade paddles. But what's interesting is even in Greenland, uh, as far away as you can get, um, in their um, folklore, there's mention and uh, acknowledge of the existence of single blade paddles, which is interesting. It may go way, way back to their, their time as, uh, as migrants from their time in Arctic North America. Um, earlier, I talked about the, uh, the context of kayaks, the, the why is a kayak um, between you know environment and cultural reasons. Um, this next section, what I'll do is I'm just gonna do some comparative um, um, presentations about that, that cover some of these these more interesting um, aspects of so tradition, localization, and innovation, uh, external influence, which which is a big one, uh, material resources, environmental conditions, and also changing hunting patterns. And like the, the larger list at the beginning of the presentation, a lot of these factors are interlinked. Um, let's see. Um, oops. There we are. Yeah, here's, a, here's an example of consistency of, of form. Uh, these, these are both uh, Labrador Inuit kayaks, uh, separated by well over 100 years. Um, this uh, upper one uh, is the oldest uh, Canadian kayak in a museum. It's, it's in a museum in uh, Rand in Brittany, and its exact date is not known. It, it could easily be a hundred years uh, older than that, just based on when um, uh, the French were in that region. Uh, it's dated pre-1750. And the other one is uh, your kayak at, at the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum, expertly surveyed by Ben Fuller, Vernon Doucette, and uh, Eugene Arima. Um, I did the drawing, but I, I, alas, I was not there and still have not seen your kayak in person. Um, but what's interesting is, is separated by, you know, at least 110 years, these two kayaks um, are nearly identical in form. The construction, the joinery, the detailing of these, um, one might think that they were built by the very same person. But, um, of course, the, the temporal separation <laughs> precludes that. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting uh, to see that. And it, what's not known about both of these is the exact community that they were collected in, which would be very valuable to know. But um, a loss. Um, here's an example of two very different um, kayaks, also from the Labrador coast, probably even nearby where those other two are from. Um, the upper one, uh, an example from 1902, very, very odd and highly curved bow. Um, the lower one, uh, an example at the Canadian Canoe Museum, um, extremely long, 24 foot two, uh, very low, um, both ends. Uh, just very, very different approaches to what must have been the same purpose, hunting sea mammals. Um, what's interesting about this difference is that um, both of these might have been how all the kayaks looked like in their, in their respective communities where they were collected at. So uh, while they differ so much from the other two, they might have been consistent forms within their community. Um, sadly, the, the community where the upper one it was collected is not known. The lower one comes from Hebron. Uh, on the Labrador coast. Uh, here's uh, a good illustration of how uh, external influence um, changed kayaks. Uh, and they changed kayaks in Greenland, West Greenland, where these two examples are from, pretty much overnight. Um, the older types were uh, long and narrow and had generally higher ends. This upper example is from 1789 at the Hunterian Museum in Scotland. It's got a very high stern, very narrow. When they hunted seals in, during this period, uh, they often waited to hunt them in uh, rough conditions where they could stalk the seals in waves, and ha they'd have to get close enough to uh, reach it with the harpoon, so limiting you around 60 feet. So uh, it was very, um, very different type of hunting. When they started carrying rifles with kayaks, um, kayaks changed overnight. They got much shorter. The ends came down. Um, and they got wider. And the reason behind that is um, you didn't need to go as fast. Um, you didn't need a high curved stern that was a lot more silent in waves because you weren't pitching in waves. You were generally hunting in much calmer water with rifles. You needed a wider kayak for, for two reasons. One is for stability. You need a much more stable boat if you're gonna be taking out this heavy piece of metal that has a lot of kick when you pull the trigger. And also, um, a rifle butt on your deck takes up a lot of space. So the extra deck space uh, that you get with a wider kayak would also be uh, very desired and helpful. So that, that changed the, the shape of rifles um, very, very quickly in Greenland. Um, 
let's see. Rifles also um, had a had a similar but different influence when they were introduced in North Alaska. This is a region that where they'd use um, uh, caribou uh, 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 kayaks for hunting caribou inland. So they'd wait for caribou to cross a, a lake or a river, and then they'd they'd rush out in their kayaks and spear them. Um, but when rifles uh, were introduced, um, kayak hunting for caribou became uh, obsolete overnight. So they just stopped stopped building them because you could hunt caribou anywhere, um, you know, any any time of the year that caribou were around without having to resort to open water on lakes to be able to approach them close enough. Um, you know, a rifle, you know, you'll, you'll get much further than a bow and arrow. Uh, during their migrations, these these people would come down to the seashore, um, um, and when they reached the seashore, you know they had rifles for seal hunting, and they could hunt seals from the shore now. But they still needed boats to get out to retrieve the seals, so they used their same kayak building technology um, to build kayaks of the same general form, but of very different proportions. The kayaks became much shorter; they didn't need to go as fast. They needed to be stable and they're much wider. Um, so they built these smaller, um, almost caricatures of their old hunting types that were called uh, retrieval kayaks or, or kayak packs, which is a little kayak um, in order to, to, um, to just bring back seals from sh shot from short distance from seals. These photos show kind of the difference. Uh, here's the longer types um, during a race at uh, Kotzebue. And then um, a much later type of kayak or, um, or little kayak. Uh, from Point Barrow. Um, these smaller kayaks actually became extinct um, probably in the 40s or 50s. They, they were seen as, uh, as a little crank, a little dangerous to get into and harder to use. Um, so they actually eventually adapted uh, very small umiaks, uh, just one man umiaks uh, that could be used for much the same purpose. Um, Many people here are probably familiar with Greenland style paddles. Uh, they've kind of become popular for recreational or, or sea kayaking paddling. Lately, they uh, just look like a, a two by four with a little narrowing in the middle where you hang onto it. But uh, they're, they're, they're very comfortable paddles to use and uh, gaining popularity. Um, so here we have an engraving from the 1600s of, of uh, Greenlanders. And there's a nice picture of a, of a hunter. Um, at the bottom, but look at his paddle. I mean, most people would see that is that's not a Greenland paddle. That looks like a it bears more resemblance to a whitewater paddle. But what's interesting is um, you go back and look at old Greenland paddles in museums, and the old ones actually bore more resemblance to that than the, than anything recognized that would be recognized today. Um, so examples from generally 1600 to 1700 are a lot broader in the middle. So they have that that kind of broad. Uh, broad shape. Um, some of the earlier ones even have drip rings on them, which is which is largely unknown in, in Greenland kayaks today. Um, you, you see, over, when you track the ones over, over the centuries, you see kind of a gradual transition. There's a period, uh, perhaps the 1700s through 800, where the, the sides were more parallel. And then the more recent ones, they actually get wider at the ends. Uh, so there's this, this gradual, um, it could be could be an evolution. It could be an innovation. It could be um, design creep. But uh, but things change over time. So sometimes gradually. But um, yeah, you're looking back. You might not recognize something from 400 years old as, as being from a from an area where where the very different forms are now. Uh, a lot of people had some some people have theorized, and I still hear this that um, the Inuit used narrow blade paddles because they didn't have wood enough to build wider ones, which is um, um, Definitely not true. Um, even in areas where there were timber down to the um, the water, like in uh, parts of Labrador, some of the longest and narrowest kayaks, or I'm sorry, the longest and narrowest paddles from the Arctic exist. Paddles two inches wide where they could easily get uh, boards 12 inches wide. So the narrowness of paddles was definitely um, uh, highly desired. Uh, here's another interesting innovation. Um, the upper kayak here, uh, both of these are East Greenland kayaks. Um, the upper one is a classic form from the 1930s, a very long, 18 foot seven, uh, just a beautiful boats, very capable boats. Um, but in the late 1960s, there was, there was a hunter in East Greenland that um, wanted to go out year round because um, there's areas even, even in um, East Greenland where there was open water year round, even in the winter, just because of swift moving currents. 
So uh, he wanted a boat that he could handle in those conditions easily. So he built a shorter uh, boat with uh, kind of more upcurved ends, you know, subtle, but but there that could handle uh, icy conditions a little better. And beyond that, he went further. He um, salvaged metal scraps uh, and he sheathed the front of his kayak with um, with metal. He put metal edging along the chines and the keelson. He even wrapped his paddle with um, with uh, pot metal and aluminum on, on one end uh, to chop through fresh ice. And so he essentially built a little icebreaker uh, for winter hunting. Uh, it's, it's quite quite an interesting innovation uh, by one of the last last hunters and kayak hunters in East Greenland. Uh, that was the kayak I measured is in a museum in, in The Hague. The kayak's from 1970, and I'm, I'm from 1972. I mean, also, so I kind of, kind of was interested in uh, maybe building a replica, but it kind of it speaks to me that innovation and and uh, it's of course it's age. Um, so here's a replica of the uh, the uh, icebreaker, um, and I, I got to say, as a kayak builder, you haven't lived until you've nailed sheet metal to a perfectly good brand new kayak. It's it's a it's a fascinating uh, experience, but uh, quite an interesting one. Harvey, um, there's. Oh, sorry. We're starting to yeah. get some interesting questions that maybe we want to. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Start yeah. to address because it's already we're we're going to start running out of time here. Oh okay uh, okay yeah, right? I, I can yeah, yeah should, should we start in with the questions or or should I I, I can or wrap up faster. <laughs> uh, well, if you want to wrap up and then we can do the questions, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll just go th go through uh, real real fast here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, the Unangan kayaks, you know, with the one hole, two hole, and three hole, that's that's another good example of um, external influence. Uh, the three hole kayaks were made to carry um, Rus Russian colonial officials around the areas. And so that's another example of uh, multi, multi hole cockpits being uh, created through external influence. And that's uh, uh, another thing you see with the Sukpiak kayaks um, uh, adjacent their region. Um, so, so they were developed so uh, Russian colonial officials could be brought around the area safely, uh, navigated by experienced um, paddlers. Now, the use of kayaks for subsistence is mostly ended. Um, there's many factors contributing to it. Um, the big one is external influences, uh, which is uh, European contact. And that can be everything from decimation from smallpox to colonialization. Um, cultural genocide, um, the introduction of rifles and jobs and, and money economy. Uh, there's only one community in the world that still uses uh, kayaks for subsistence today, and that's in Northwest Greenland, Kanak, for a um, uh, bowhead, I mean, I'm sorry, not bowhead, a narwhal hunt every year. Um, but umiaks are still used for whaling in North Alaska at Point Barrow, so skin boats are still used for subsistence. Um, the photo here shows the Greenland National Kayak Championships. Kayaks are still used around the Arctic, uh, largely for cultural purposes, also recreation, and even sport hunting in places. Um, but in Greenland, there's a national championship. And, and this last example is another innovation. Um, this, this extremely shallow kayak was wholly optimized to win medals in the rolling competitions at the Greenland National Kayak Championships. So even in an area where they haven't subsistence hunted for 60 years, um, they're still adapting their kayak technologies for their, their purpose. In this case, winning medals in competitions. This uh, rolling kayak is only four and three quarter inches deep. So much shallower yet than the East Greenland kayaks. This was also surveyed by uh, Vernon Doucette and, uh, and another friend of mine, Richard Nonis. Um, of the 600 kayaks in museums, uh, maybe 10% are on exhibit. Um, they're very delicate um, objects. They don't always line up with the, the uh, mission of a museum. Um, they're, they're just hard to store and delicate. So um, it's really wonderful that your museum has uh, such a wonderful kayak to exhibit. And also um, an expertly built replica by Fred and Noah um, that, that people can um, get more of a hands-on look at or just a real close look at the frame and the joinery. Um, there's not many places to see kayaks on exhibits. This, this photo is from the Danish National Museum. That's probably the best in the world to see kayaks. The Canadian Canoe Museum uh, in Peterborough, Ontario is also, um, that's, that's probably one of the best also. There's not many places to see this. So it's, uh, it's, it's great that you have, uh, a real kayak on exhibit there. And um, with that, I'll, I'll end. Um, 
with a lovely view into a 1935 King Island kayak. Um, thank you, thank you again, and I, I look forward to, to your questions. Well, thanks, Harvey. That was really, really fascinating, and there, I'm thank sure you. there's questions coming in even as we speak. But I'll start with them in order. I don't know if you can see them. Um, I can see them. So. Um, okay. Yeah. Let, let, let me shut down my uh, my my uh, screen right. and. Uh, yeah, then and get my camera back on yeah, here. Yeah. Let's see. So our first question, as your camera comes back, is from Mike Drake. And he says um, that you mentioned in your book, he doesn't say which book, that the hunters of the North had a certain mentality. For instance, they wouldn't use rabbit skins because rabbits are timid animals. Can you talk oh, about yeah. the mentality of the hunters? Wow, yeah, that, that's a, there's, a, there's so much about this. And um, well, I should start by saying I don't know much about it, but, uh, but yeah, there, there's many examples of um, um, superstitions or beliefs or even, even practical aspects of that. Um, there's, um, gosh, um, I've heard the rabbit one. Um, it's so also uh, many instances of amulets being placed in boats. Um, some of them fairly gruesome. Nunavak Island, they put human jaw bones in the back of the kayak. Um, um, there's also uh, rituals about uh, whether uh, women, women could come in contact with the hunter's kayak, uh, you know, I, I guess ostensibly jinxing it before hunts. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's uh, a number of examples of that. I, I don't I'm not coming up with many off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, there's this fascinating superstition. I think you see that with all seafaring cultures everywhere. Um, yeah. 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 So um, Sarah has asked if there's any evidence of when and where people first learned to roll kayak. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I do not know that. That's um, Yet uh, <laughs> that would be a hard one to find uh, indirect evidence of or, or direct evidence. But uh, what, what's interesting is, is people associate the Greenlanders with, with rolling primarily. And um, they definitely had it down to the high art. But um, there's examples in uh, historic texts and folklore of um, pretty much all kayak using cultures rolling their kayaks. The Aleutian Islanders, there's no information existent as to how they did it or what methods, but there's a lot of, um, of uh, descriptions of them having done it. And even, even the larger kayaks like from Nunavak Island that are um, you know, as deep as, as, as your armpits and 30 inches wide, those were kayaks that were rolled um, by hunters. So yeah. it, 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 it's, it's definitely uh, um, prevalent. If where there's skin boats, there's probably rolling historically. Is that because it's so important for safety. Yeah, the, the just just getting out of a kayak into such cold water um, is 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 pretty much a death sentence. Um, I, I don't think you have many minutes of life, and those last minutes are not going to be very functional as your body shuts down. And to let water into a boat like that is is um, is to invite death. Um, you know, I talked about the independence of kayak hunting, but there was, you know, while you're the captain of your own kayak, there were hunting partnerships. It was uh, pretty folly to go hunting without a partner within at least shouting distance where you could render aid. Um, if someone did tip over and didn't roll, you could um, bang on your kayak and they could come over and help you up. So um, e even, even when people didn't know how to roll, there was often partnerships with kayaks, kayak hunting. Um, we have, a, I guess, a, more of a comment than a question, I guess. Oh, well, and she has a question as well. Evgenia, she has a comment that on the three person kayaks. Uh, yes, yeah. That they, she suggests that there is some Unangan lore on multi hatch kayaks built for training and also um, sometimes with an indigenous chief sitting in the middle. I, on mod, I guess there are some models like that. I don't know if you've seen those. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah there is. Um, I, th I, think, I think it's Lydia Black, she mentions there having been um, three whole kayaks and I think the, the westernmost Aleutian Islands. Um, but uh, the sources 
that I've seen her. It's a little apocryphal, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I was going to talk a bit more about the um, the the history of of two and three seaters, but <laughs> I had to wrap up faster. It, but uh, I know there's so much to say. That's the oh yeah oh yeah there really yeah, is <laughs> yeah. Um, but she also asks why do mm -hmm. some people use double bladed versus single bladed? Um, and oh, that's, that's a good, people that use that's both? a good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the gener generally on the descriptions I've seen is that. Um, Double blade pa paddles were seen as faster. Uh, the, the Yupik, for example, in the, the southern Inupiat used um, both. So that you uh, would often see a photo or picture and they'd have both types. Um, the double blade paddles were seen as faster, yeah. but the single blade paddles were preferred for hunting. And, and the reason for that, I, I think, I don't know that I've seen it verified, is that they were quieter. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, the Victoria Sea Kayak Club, I presume, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's Victorian, I don't know if it's from Victoria, BC, or I don't mm -hmm. know where they're from, but uh, they ask, what materials do you skin your replicas with? Mm -hmm. um, I skin them with, uh, with nylon uh, sealed with varnish. So it's, it's light and resilient. Um, it lacks many of the properties of skin, of course, but um, they, uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't have to replace them every year. <laughs> no animals are hurt in the making of them. But uh, I, I, have, I have made um, one kayak covered in deer skin. So um, I was missing out on the whole experience working with skin. So I did cover one with deer skin just to understand that process a bit more. And I gained a lot of respect for it and hope I never have to do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite an amazing. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, just looking, there are there are lots of thank yous and comments and things like that. Um, but there's Tom says hi. Hey, John. I don't know what Tom it is? Um, I, he asks if the Siglet kayak in the Vatican Museum has been surveyed yet. No, it has not. Um, I know one person that has seen it. Um, and I have written the Vatican and not heard back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, now is not the time to go, I suppose. Now is not the time, alas. Yeah, there's so many, yeah. My, my, my third book is on hold just because I can't travel, but. Uh. <laughs> um, and finally, Verna W asks, is there any, any information about how old kayakers would be to start hunting and would they inherit the kayak or build their own? Ah, good question, yeah. Um, it depended on the region. You see different ages for different regions. I think um, sometimes five or six. I, actually, in Greenland today, the championships, um, you see six-year-olds competing. Um, and the oldest I've seen was an 83-year-old when I, when I was there. But um, in terms of learning to kayak, generally, I think around 10 or 12, um, certain areas where there was more reliance on it they probably started earlier and there was certainly training you could start earlier without actually being in a kayak uh, like conditioning the uh, unangan did various kayak conditioning techniques for the children even before they got into boats um and in regions where there were two sea kayaks a child could be taken out safely in a kayak yeah. but even even in greenland you see historic photos of a hunter in a kayak with with a, a child sitting on his lap you know, just to get the experience yeah. of it. So, yeah. yeah, in terms of making kayaks, uh, generally a father would, would build a kayak for his, his son. Some communities had professional kayak builders that you, you could buy a kayak from them or have them make one for you, but uh, yeah. So I think what you've done today is given us all an amazing introduction and a taste of how much more interesting things we have to learn about kayaks. Certainly, even oh, yeah. after having done the exhibit, I'm still learning lots and lots every time I talk Me to too. And, Me too. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a vast and fascinating area. It is. Uh, is to get out of them. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, Harvey, for- Oh, well, well thank you so much, yeah. Presentation and, I, I do hope you can come and see our kayak someday. It's, it's I would love to, I would love to. Yeah, I was, I was really looking forward to that in April and meeting Noah yeah. and seeing Fred oh, again. It's been so yeah. disappointing, but hopefully yeah. maybe next year we'll be able to meet in person and you can inspect and see this kayak that you did such a beautiful drawing of. Mm -hmm. And oh, great, thank you. so on behalf of everyone, thank you very much. 
and mm -hmm. I will um, just for the people who are the audience, uh, we will be sending it. We'll be arranging some other um, presentations as we uh, go on. The exhibit will continue being on for quite some time, so you can look forward to hearing from more people about traditional hayaking in the near future. So keep an eye on our webpage, come and visit our exhibit. And now you should go have a cup of tea and a nice snack, which we would wish we could provide to you ourselves, but you'll have to provide your own right now. All right, so thank you everyone. And thank you. Bye-bye.